Uh, welcome. Um, my name is Nick Lemon. I'm the uh, former dean of Columbia Journalism School, but for purposes, uh, and professor there now, but for purposes of this gathering, I was a member of the uh, American Academy's Commission on the Future of Undergraduate Education. Um, I'm biased, but I think the commission did a, a really wonderful job and, and had a long series of careful research efforts and hearings all over the country that I was uh, happy to take part in. Um, we published a report, I guess, in November two years ago. Um, and then as, as uh, one of, I, we hope, a series of follow-on uh, events is this issue of Daedalus, um, which is co-edited by the commission's co-chair, Mike McPherson, and uh, Sandy Baum, who is um, a, a great educational economist and also Mike's wife. In a, in a minute, uh, you're going to see this screen go live, and they're going to live stream the beginning of this event. They're at the Academy's headquarters in, in uh, Cambridge. Um, so they're going to talk about the issue and this issue of Daedalus, like really any second. Um, then we have uh, locally the authors of one of the articles in this issue of Daedalus. They're going to come up and, and do a, a non-live stream actual physical presentation from these two chairs. And then um, they'll take questions from the audience. And then we'll end the event at 7.15 PM. So that's, that's the you know, basic drill. Um, if I can just, uh, speaking as a journalist with a little time to fill before they go live, uh, grouse about one thing, and I'm preaching to the choir here at Teachers College. Uh, in my profession, there's this kind of weird obsession with Ivy League universities. Um, so uh, virtually, well, not all, but a very large percent of the coverage to the public of issues in undergraduate education focuses on highly particularized uh, questions that don't affect a hell of a lot of people. Um, meanwhile, there are vastly more important questions uh, in, in undergraduate education that affect millions of people um, that uh, can be challenging to draw attention to. That's what's in Daedalus. Um, and that's what's in the commission's report. And I hope uh, this event is, um, you know, one of a long series that, that cause attention to pivot uh, from things like the college admission scandal that some of you may have followed that is irresistibly juicy but involves maybe a few dozen people out of the millions in, in higher education, and, and it would be great if, uh, thanks to the commission's work and the Daedalus author's work and, and the work of people at Teachers College, I don't need to sell, I don't think that hard on what I just said, if, if we could get the country to focus on the real issues and not the sideshow issues. So that's, I hope, the, the, spirit, of, of, um, the spirit of the evening. So it's a pleasure to, you know, to be able to uh, uh, to talk about some work. This is work that I've actually did for many years, uh, so it kind of brings a lot of different things together. Um, so let me say that uh, I was also listening to this and trying to figure out exactly how we fit in. We're not talking about teaching uh, specifically, but we are talking about what it is that people learn uh, in what sorts of circumstances. Uh, how those things fit together. Uh, so I do think that it, uh, it does link to the, uh, to the topics that we're, that we're talking about. Uh, so this is, uh, go back to this. So this is the false dichotomy between academic learning and occupational skills. So um, there's, uh, I think people probably kind of at a general level understand the distinction or that what the distinction that's made. There are some jobs or some education that's kind of specifically about training people for work. So this often in federal legislation and uh, in a generally now called career and technical education. So you can read that 
uh, that definition. Uh, so CT generally refers to educational programs that are specifically designed to prepare students for future employment in a particular sector, sector or occupation. So you look at that, it combines academic and, uh, and, and work-related skills. I just have to say that everything we do in this building fits into that definition. So just want to think about whether, uh, I'm not sure that, you know, generally we think that we're in a CTE uh, institution, but if you look at that definition, I, I challenge you to, uh, you know, to make a distinction between what it is that we're doing here and, and what that uh, definition is. Now, there's a growing interest in career and technical education. Now, I'm not actually sure that there is a growing interest. I mean, there's, it kind of comes and goes. Uh, you know, that's one thing that you, you know, as your career grows longer and longer, you understand that there's things that you talked about many years ago that have kind of come back. But so just to kind of give you sort of a definition, you know, of course, we, uh, giving a shout out to Community College Research Center, Nick, which is, of course, studying the, you know, exactly those types of institutions and presumably the types of things that Daedalus is, is interested in. So if you think of what are CTE jobs, so there are sort of CTE education, there, there are certificate programs, uh, which are usually less than two years, often a year, like um, emergency medical technician, that, that would be one of them. they are occupational associate's degree programs, uh, that is job, uh, so two-year degrees designed specifically to, for somebody to go to work after that. Uh, there's a, a different training organizations, nonprofits that do training, and I guess you'd also put apprenticeship of some kind or some combination of work-based learning programs into that. So why has there been a growing interest in this? Well, first of all, there seems, it seems to be a shorter direct route to employment. So you don't get caught up in studying German philosophy and, and you, you know, get a training, job training immediately. Now, I, I guess I'm always a little bit uncomfortable about that, uh, especially people who are arguing that people should go into that because they get jobs more quickly, is because we tend to send the uh, students of color or low-income students into these jobs, often the commentators, you know, who are suggesting this route, you know, their kids are at Columbia here rather than in these types of education. So I think that's one thing. I mean, you can think about, if you think about uh, a one-year program, it's got a higher completion rate than a four-year or even a two-year program. So if you're concerned as they were about completion, that might be something. Other countries do it successfully. I mean, my entire career, I've been hearing about Germany and Austria and Switzerland that have apprenticeship programs and aren't they so successful and why can't we do that and other kinds of things. So I think that's one reason and that we've heard that again. There's been a kind of resurgence of interest in apprenticeship. There's some, now some federal, a small amount of federal money that's, that's devoted to that as there has been in the past. That sort of comes and goes. Now, presumably, there are lots of employers begging for these workers, and so we hear there's skill shortages, that you, know, you can be a plumber and get a good job. You don't have to go all the way through a four-year college. I'm a bit skeptical about that. I am an economist, and so I think, OK, what are happening to the wages in these things for which there are such great shortages? Uh, and often, they're not going up. As a matter of fact, wages in general haven't gone up that much, so I'm a bit skeptical about that. And then there are sort of political considerations. Now, this is a little bit surprising to some extent. I mean, I think in general, uh, you know, conservatives have been, have been suspicious of four-year institutions or liberal arts type of colleges because they seem to promote a liberal perspective. Uh, and so we're certainly, recently, we've seen a lot of interest, especially in short-term. Uh, people can get jobs. They should get jobs quickly. They don't have to go to college, et cetera. But at the same time, I think there's a, uh, there's a, the other side of that, there are certainly progressives who, who have been enthusiastic about uh, apprenticeship for a long time, who've thought that the kind of college for all model maybe isn't right for everyone. And by that, I think they usually mean a four-year college for all, so that everybody doesn't have to do that. So there's sort of a problem of forcing or encouraging everybody to get a four-year college when, in fact, they could get good jobs with less. So I think there's that kind of 
there's sort of political consideration in that all the time. You can think now there's probably a stronger political consideration issues, but nevertheless, that's always been. I, it, it was interesting that, you know, if you, as we studied community colleges and you would talk to people in community colleges and, you know, they might be very enthusiastic, but you, you know, it, it was unlikely to be able to tell what party they were you know, they tended to be for. Because, you know, there wasn't, a, there was a very different kind of perspective on a community college than perhaps there was on a four-year college. Okay, so what is it that separates? Why do we have a category of workforce education or CTE? Why does that exist? Why are we talking about that? And so that's an interesting question. Of course, I have a straw man, which then I can knock down, but nevertheless, you might have other arguments for that. And one is that skills. So there's a different, some sort of different set of skills that, that, that occupational education needs, and we're going to teach those in CTE, and then there's some other academic skills or something else that we're going to teach in, in, in college or out, not in CTE or in academic education. There's another level of required education by occupation. Now, many years ago, we worked on an evaluation of the Perkins Act, the Perkins Act, which is, comes under various names, but that's essentially the federal uh, CTE legislation. Uh, and they, and th at that time, and this was like about 2000, it was said, this is, an about, this is for, for occupations that qu require less than a bachelor's degree. So that was kind of the definition that they had. So can we identify uh, occupations that require less than a bachelor's degree? You know, a plumber doesn't require a bachelor's degree, but you know, uh, some accountants do, et cetera. So that was that definition. And finally, <clears throat> there was the idea that, you know, people who are looking for jobs versus the people who are doing education. So I know if you really think about that, it, maybe that doesn't make that much sense. But nevertheless, these are, this is job preparation versus some other kind of education that, that's, that's going on. So let me talk a little bit about those three, uh, those three arguments. So first of all, this is a definition. I'm sorry there's so many words. I know you're not supposed to do that. but. This is a definition of the skills required by people in CTE <coughs> programs. Now, Advanced CTE is the a national organization that's essentially the organization of the state leaders of, of career and technical education in each state. Right, so these are funded by the federal uh, legislation that funds CTE education. So you just read that, right? Acts as a responsible and contributing citizen and employee. I mean, you can go through those things. Uh, communicate clearly and effectively and with reason. Well, now, that's, those are all great. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of the occupations, the non-CTE occupations that you, that, that you don't want those skills for. So, and, and I think, of course, if you think those of us in, you know, who went to, you know, to liberal arts colleges or had that kind of experience, these are exactly the types of skills that presumably are being taught or that students are, in fact, learning uh, when they're having that experience. So this is, <clears throat> I tried to line up. So if you look at the, these are the repeat of the advanced CTE uh, skills, and those are, uh, so that's the kind of workforce preparation skills. And the ones on the right is this is a Heart Research Associates survey asking employers what they're looking for from college graduates. Now, they don't line up exactly, but they're pretty much the same. So anyway, I think that, <clears throat> that the idea that there's some different kind of skill that they're working, I don't think that that argument holds up if you really think about that. I mean, you might say, well, OK, but the plumber is also learning how to like, fix a pipe. But you know the surgeon is also learning how to fix a different kind of pipe, you know. <clears throat> so why is that different? You know, is it like less or something? So what about the occupational level? Okay, so I know this is a, a difficult, uh, but the idea that there's some occupations that require less than a bachelor's degree, those are CTE occupations, and others that require more, those are <clears throat> bachelor's degrees. So this is. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain this, but so these are all these 160 occupations are lined up. You can imagine they're lined up in a column all the way across, and they're lined up by the order of the percent of the percentage of their of their occupants who have bachelor's degrees. So the thing I want you to to point out is if you look at the greenish line, which is this, which is the some college or associate's degrees, it turns out that between 20 and 50 percent of Ever, of all of, of, of people in all of the occupations, except maybe the last you know, 10 or 15 percent, have some college. 
So it's extremely difficult to actually identify an occupation that is less than two years. Nursing is a perfect example. You can get an associate's degree in nursing and become an RN with a two-year degree. So is that a CTE job? If you get a bachelor's degree, then that's a non, that's an academic job. You know, so that's a kind of example of that. So I think that definition doesn't work very well. It's, there's too much variation in occupations. Clive will say, uh, say something more about that. So, you know, it, it, that, that doesn't give us a road map to differentiating that. Now, finally, what about the goals of, what about the goals? I want to work and you want to study. Well, so this is a quote from Dewey, which I actually found long before I had anything to do with Teachers College and didn't realize I'd be passing his bust every day on the way to work. <laughs> So I really like this. Many a teacher and author writes and argues in behalf of a culture and humane education against the encroachments of a specialized practical education without recognizing that his own education, sorry, this was written in 1917, so that's why it's his, right? His own education, which he calls liberal, has been mainly training for his own particular calling. So that's true. I know that you know, Clive, Nick, and I, our undergraduate education actually was a specific training for you know, what we were doing. Uh, I think that's true of many of you. If you look at the colleges, there's 17 colleges at Columbia. There's only two, you could, two of them, possibly, Barnard and Columbia undergraduate, you might say aren't specifically about training people for work. And all of the, almost everyone in those two colleges will go eventually to one of the other 15 or something like one of the other 15, 15 colleges. So you know, where are these people who aren't in college for work? I'm sure there's some. You know, but I think it's, it's, now that's not saying that it's only about work, but I think that try to, to identify some jobs or some people who are looking for work and others who aren't, I think if you really dig into that, that starts to look like a kind of bias that we'd rather not, I think, you know, uh, engage in. So anyway, that's my, those are, those are the three arguments. I don't think you can separate the skills I don't think there's a way to define occupations by their academic level. And finally, I don't think there's a, there's a bunch of people who want to work, and then there's a bunch of people who don't want to work and are in education for that. So I don't, you know, perhaps some of you have a, some other arguments about why we should have these two categories, but I don't, think, I don't think it serves us well, and I think it's confusing and really leads us socially in a direction I don't think we want to go. So Clive. CCRC, which is a, a research center at, at Teachers College, did a lot of work for about five years on uh, wage paths for uh, students. And this is the entire research activity and it's summarized in one picture. You move along. If you go to community college, you start community college at year zero, and then you move along. And if you're a dropout, your wages are pretty much flat for the next 10 years. If you're an associate's degree holder by the end of community college, you can see your wages are nice and upward sloping, and you get a nice trajectory there of higher, higher wages as you move through your career. But when we looked at certificates, which we thought were pretty much close to the CTE core definition, we saw that you could draw either of those two red lines. You could draw a group of certificates, some of them in very prescribed courses, where you got a nice return over time, and your wages would, would grow after you leave college, and then they would stay quite a bit above the people who didn't complete college. But then there was a big proportion, non-trivial proportion, of certificate holders who looked almost exactly like dropouts. They uh, didn't do very well, their earnings were flat, and their CTE seemed to not work out for them at all. So I'm going to talk about a few things in relation to uh, CTE and the labor market. And the kind of overall um, uh, thrust of the argument is that uh, the, the labor market and CTE do not map so clearly that we should be really reinforcing an idea of CTE in the colleges. Because when the students get out, we're not really sure that they're actually doing any CTE as we think about it. And in fact, from that literature, it's pretty clear that the word C is a big overreach. This is not a career move for a lot of these students. 
This is just technical education. They're not getting on a better career. They might get a little bit of a boost if you do a labor, if you do a certificate. So we kind of summarize it as the labor market returns to certificates are modest. They vary from subject to subject, and they're not very long lasting. They're not career technical education. They're technical education, which will help you a little bit, and then you're going to need some more technical education. So we probably should drop the career part of CTE and just call it technical education. By contrast, the labor market returns to associate's degrees, which include a much more general educational component, are significant, they're pretty broad across the subjects that students study in community college, and they seem to endure over time. So you get returns that you can, that you can build on and that last in the labor market. So that's our first uh, way to think about the labor market. The second way to think about the labor market is that, okay, uh, these students, they need this CTE. We're going to give them these specific skills. Let's figure out the right skills for them. Let's ask employers what sort of skills these students should have by the time they get out of college. And when we look at the literature, the employers basically want all sorts of skills. Do you want technical skills? Yes. Do you want social skills? Yes. Would you like some cognitive skills? Yes. How about some personality skills? Yeah, that would be nice too. They ask for all sorts of skills. They ask for academic skills and social skills until they ask for both of those two sets of skills all at the same time. So it's not at all clear that there's a primacy of technical skills that employers want. And then they say, okay, yeah, we need this guy to do re be really good coder, but also we'd like a little bit of personality as well. It's not the case. They, they think of these skills as often substitutable, complementary in some cases. So there's no kind of hierarchy of you've got to be the best coder or the best uh, a technical person. And that's the person we're going to hire. So that's the first way in which the kind of this idea of a, a hierarchy of skills is undermined uh, when we get out into the labor market. The second thing is that uh, people have a lot of skills, but those skills are not often applied constantly in their jobs. So uh, you can think of a job where you say you have skills as a plumber, but how much time do you actually spend under the sink as a plumber? Not all of your time is spent doing that. A lot of time is spent negotiating with people, planning activities. So there are a lot of tasks that don't readily map to the kind of technical skills that you think you learn in college. And then when you look at jobs, you see that jobs are a bundle of tasks, some of which require technical skills, some of which require general skills. And it's not easy to separate them out. So if you look at the list of all of the tasks that you're supposed to do for your job. I did this for my own job as an economics professor to see how many of the tasks I was supposed to do that I do actually do. It was close to half. Uh, the, the skills and the tasks, are they're not easily mapped into uh, a set of technical things that I can do to kind of tick these off as, yes, I have that skill. I clearly know how to grade an essay. Those types of things are, are the, the jobs are much more sophisticated, much more complicated bundles rather than just simply technical tasks. Uh, if we look at how the labor market has progressed, if you're an economist, you talk about how, oh, the labor market has changed to emphasize more skills. So you might think, well, if, if uh, CTE programs could just teach those skills, that would, be, that would be great. But the economics literature has not really specified much of what this skill bias technological change is, other than routine manual tasks are not performed anymore, but all sorts of other tasks, cognitive manual tasks, uh, cognitive tasks, manual tasks, non-routine tasks, those are all still being performed uh, in, in most jobs, even with a wide, uh, broad change in uh, technology across the labor market. So that kind of leads us to a question of if CTE was so easy, we should be able to just map these skills out and we should just be able to drill them into the students from a set of educational programs. But that seems a very over-prescriptive view of what we could do given what we understand about the skills that students need in the labor market. Now if we go to occupation, uh, Tom put up the fact that most occupations include all sorts of uh, people with different qualifications, BAs, AAs, 
So no occupation appears to have no community college graduates in it. Most occupations have a lot of uh, people with different education levels. Um, so that uh, occupation is not a very good uh, way to think about uh, assigning students to programs so that they can get, and get an occupation. The economics literature on, on what occupations are required is terrible. About two-thirds of people have BAs. If you ask economists how many people should have BAs, the answer is about one-third. We're way off in our models as to how much what sort of occupations need degrees and don't need degrees in economics. And then the third point there is a pretty striking one, which uh, uh, you guys may experience. The growth in wage inequality has almost nothing to do with your occupation. In the old days, the best thing to do was to find a doctor and marry a doctor, or find a lawyer and marry a lawyer. That was good advice. I should have taken it, but it was good advice. But no, you can be a lawyer, and you can be chief counsel for ExxonMobil, and you could be pulling down millions. You can be a lawyer and be a public defender in the Bronx, and you're not pulling down millions of dollars. You can be a surgeon. You can be a doctor. Uh, the, all the wage inequality we see, most of it is that the top is getting higher, further and further away from the bottom, not so much that the bottom is getting, going further and further down, but the top wages are just going further and further up. It's nothing to do with your occupation. You can be a super wealthy plumber, and you can be a low-income plumber, too. So if the students come to me and they say, I want to be a plumber, I have no idea what to say. That's a good job. That's a bad job. I, I, it's a job. I don't really know. Similarly, even with lawyers, you could say you can be a low-paid lawyer. It's not a stretch to say that there are hardly any low-paying occupations. There are, there are occupations with high, high pay and low pay, but th there's no determinate occupation that you're siloed into that is going to give you very low pay. That's a very striking result that economists have discovered that we're still trying to work through. But the growth in wage inequality has very little to do with occupations. So if I'm teaching a, a, an occupational CTE program, I cannot tell you whether your wages are going to be high or low from that program, broadly. OK, the last part of my contribution is, OK, I'm teaching this CTE program. I'm going to make sure that my students get out of here, and they need to be able to compete with the other people who are going to take their jobs. Who are the other people who are going to take their jobs? The robots. The robots are going to take their jobs. So I need to give my CTE program needs to be a good program because the robots are coming. <laughs> Except we have a lot of history of talking through this. Robots, 3D printing, autonomous vehicles, computers, AI. There's a lot of different robots. Many of them are extremely slow at arriving and may not really make much of a dent in your skills, we're not really sure how much of a threat any of those things are. If you read the New York Times, this is the worst thing that could ever happen. A robot moves in next door, you're going to be unemployed next week. <laughs> but if you look at the literature, the literature suggests that some of those changes, especially 3D printing, some of those changes have very little effect on your skill needs. Insofar as they do have any effect on your skill needs, you want to be complementary to a robot. So you want to be able to work well with a robot, like I'm doing with this navigator. You need to be able to work well with a robot, but I need to know what skills the robot has that I can complement, or vice versa, that the robot can complement my skills. Insofar as I think the robots are coming, the robots are much more technical than I am. I'm, they're technical, so if I learn some CTE, I'm learning technical skills, and the robot is saying, I'm learning technical skills too, and you're not very good at technical skills, Mr. Human. I'm the one who's really good at technical skills, so I'm afraid I'm going to get the job. You're not going to get the job. So I think insofar as a CTE program is just pure, pushing purely technical skills, it might lose out to the robot because the robot is probably very good at technical skills. So I think 
It's not obvious. I'm not very uh, excited about the robot. I'm not super worried about the robots. But if I was worried about them, I'd just be especially worried if I had just technical skills. If all I had was technical skills and the robots were coming, I would be kind of worried because I'm not complimentary to them. OK, <laughs> let's finish up so that we can warm up. Tom and I sort of put this in a, what we call a general technical framework. And it's kind of summarized in the following way, which is we really don't want to get too prescriptive, too dogmatic, too determinative about the types of college programs, technical programs, that students should be taking. Because the association between college programs and labor market skills, needs, jobs, occupations, and robot substitutability, they're, they're not straightforward at all. They're kind of ambiguous. They're developing. They're changing. They're not straightforward. So I think what we then say is, well, wait a minute. How come everybody's been always getting these jobs for years and years? And the answer is that they, there are a lot of general skills that you use that you apply with your technical skills. And those are the things we would like you to get as many of as possible and then kind of at the last minute, right before you hand in your, you shake the president's hand, right before then, get as much technical skills as you can, because those are the direct skills that are going to be applicable the moment you leave and that the, are task-oriented to the job that you kind of have in mind as soon as you leave your, um, your, your as soon as you terminate your education. So right before terminating, switch to some sort of technical education. If you want to call it technical education, because it's had such a large amount of general skills in it, recognizing that based on the evidence, this is not going to be career technical education. It's just going to be technical education, and that it's not a straightforward map from, I learned to be a plumber, so I'm going to be high earning, or I learned to be a doctor, so I'm going to be high earning, or I got my law degree, so I'm going to be in a high paying position. Uh, thank you so much. Any questions, discussion, objections? Nick. So uh, on, the, uh, on the Commission on the Future of Undergraduate Education, you know, we were um, worried the default of a commission like this from a body like the, the Academy would be to say, well, we've got two major points, you know, uh, Colleges are great, and uh, they're underfunded. So we really tried hard to be self-critical. There was one issue that I kept raising in commission meetings, and only one where all the commission members said, no, 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 that's too hot to handle. So I'm going to ask you. Should there be core curricula in undergraduate, you know, what you're calling liberal education, or is it safe to assume that if, if they're sort of in college, in a sort of college environment, that all that stuff will get absorptively picked up and all the benefits you're talking about will, will accrue? Well, I, I, I think that, I don't think, that, I don't think you can say that. I mean, if you look at those skills that everybody thinks we need, and I think we all would agree with those, I think we, you know, getting to the topic of what teaching is, I think we, we're not sure how to teach those, or I think we can, we can do a lot more in figuring out exactly how to teach those and to be able to teach those efficiently. Uh, so so I, I'm sh uh, you know, I, I think that to some extent one of the points we're making is that it's very difficult to have a highly prescribed, there's not like a kind of a laundry list of check off that we can do, we've learned this skill, we've learned this skill. So there is a certain amount of uh, ambiguity with that, so I think that's, but I think we need to, I mean, I, I totally agree that our, uh, you know, we haven't spent a lot of time thinking and studying teaching it, you know, in, in higher education. Well, I'm not asking about mm -hmm. teaching, I'm asking about course content. That yeah. is, is this aura of, if you call it a liberal education and it walks and talks and quacks like a liberal education, then it doesn't matter exactly what it consists of, all the benefits of a liberal education are going to happen. Fair? No, I, well, I, I, th I think that <coughs> that's, to some extent, that's true. But I don't, you know, I, I, I don't think we can really nail that down or really know exactly what that is. And there's certainly, there has to be different 
you know, combinations or distributions of that <clears throat> that are more effective. Actually, but I, but I think a more, I, I, I guess I, you know, somebody going to Columbia, I mean, I'm, like, I'm not too worried about that, but, but everyone isn't going to four years. So what do you do about teaching those skills in two years or one year programs? And I you know, think our argument is, is that that has to happen as well. Right, so you're. So I think that's a, you know, that's a, you know, that's a more difficult question to answer. There's less time uh, to do that. The, you know, those students have less money. They often they're working as so they're all of those kinds of things. So to me, the, you know, the the way the the difficult question is how to, you know, how can you do that in a shorter amount of time? So. I guess to follow. On that question, I, I wonder if you all could define what you refer to as general education uh, in, in a two-year program. Uh, because you, you listed, I, I think, and thank you very much, very persuasively, how important it is to, edu to uh, employers that they get ethical people, that they get people that can have bring critical reasoning skills. Where, where, where are they learned? Well, I mean, you said for, well, I don't, do you want to try to answer that? Go ahead. So, well, you said in a two-year, I mean, I'd ask the same question in a four-year college or any kind of, you know, uh, kind of education. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I think that those, I mean, this is really the same answer to you. I mean, if we want to think, of, we don't think of a curriculum that actually includes all of those things. And so to some extent, we kind of have a faith that, you know, that students, finding their way through um, you know, a, a post-secondary curriculum will pick those things up. And I think in many cases they do. But I think, if we, you know, I think we need to be more conscious and specifically about how it is we're teaching, what it is, how will we know that, you know, that those skills are being learned. I mean, I think, I think if you just look at the, uh, if you, I, th I think if you, if you look at the, at the wage trajectories and if you think of that as, uh, what skills people have that allow their wages to continue to grow. So I think that that Clive slide about the, you know, the summary of everything that we'd done at CCRC on one slide, you know, what you get with those technical skills is a bump in your earnings and then they stay flat. Whereas if you have a, if you have a broader, you know, degree that includes other types of things other than the technical skills, so those are going to include English and other sorts of skills, then that gives you the background that allows your wages to continue to grow. So, I mean, right now, I think it's in, uh, you know, it's in the type of uh, distribution requirements and uh, general uh, academic courses that students are, are required to take to get a degree whether that's the optimal exact distribution of those skills i you know i'm sure that it isn't but just in a very general sense looking at the 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 future wage distribution that kind of gives you a sense of what that is do you mind putting the slide back up the one fantastic slide so i'm interested it's in all fantastic i mean which one were you talking about <laughs> the one slide the only one that matters <laughs> So I haven't read the study, but I'm curious to know, how do you prove that the associate's degree is actually the reason that those people uh, earn more? Or has anyone done that study where you assign someone to do the associate's versus the certificate and you determine whether they have those skills already? Is it the degree that, that, that uh, provides those skills or would those people have earned those uh, greater earnings anyway? You mean, is it a selection problem? Right. So I don't know, do you want to, I mean. So it's not possible to randomly assign the students to programs. Yeah. Uh, so all we can do is control for different characteristics of the students. And we have a lot of different characteristics for these students. These are students who have followed over time, so you can see a lot of differences across the students. Uh, we have information about their earnings before they started, so we have a lot of information about what they were like before they started college. It's not possible to randomly assign them. So we can't tell how much of this is causal. Uh, there are a lot of different studies that have attempted to get at the causality issue, and most of them conclude that, that the raw, the pretty much raw, almost unadjusted profiles map to a causality explanation rather than a 
endogeneity or selection or omitted variable bias problem. Um, and these are all, this is a pretty narrow band of people here, the dropout, these are dropouts from community college. So these are all people who are within the same band of entry into college. And you can see there at the start, their wages are all pretty much the same before they go in. It's not possible to randomly assign them, so we can't definitively say. But there are a lot of different studies exploiting different uh, circumstances to suggest that uh, the returns to uh, different, the returns look a bit like this pattern. So, so we, we, there's probably, you know, we had a, a, a center for five years that studied, that just looked, th these were the types of issues that we looked at. Uh, and so, you know, you should take a look at those. But I, but I think that, that, yeah, I would agree with Clive that the sort of consensus is that, you know, these types of differences are not just that, you know, selection or students, the students ha happen to get associate's degrees, who would have gotten those things anyway? And one of the things is really by looking at the tra trajectory of earnings of individuals before they get that education. So as you can see there, there's, it's not as if the green people were high and then now they're high again. So. Hi, Professor. In the conclusion part, I remember there's a suggestion, suggestion saying that we should provide student with a techni technical education right before the terminal of higher education. So how you define the exact point to, for them to have this technical education? Is there really exist this time, like critical time? Well, they, I guess it depends on, uh, do you want to answer that? Sure. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So there's no optimal time. It's obviously going to vary from person to person. But uh, the idea is rather than think of CTE as this thing on its own that doesn't bear any relationship to the general education that you've had and that might actually be then used later when you go back to do even more education, that's not the right way to think about it. It's more that you kind of start when you think about when are you going to terminate your education, what are the specific skills you're going to need then, and if you want to call that CTE, you can call that CTE, the bits where you really map specific tasks that you're going to be doing to your job, and you learn those tasks. So there's no, you know, oh, it's two years before you've got to do this. If you think about it, uh, that way, then you're thinking, I'm going to try to accumulate as much general education as I can, and then however much time I've got left, then I'm going to use that as my technical education. If you don't get anything that you think of as technical education, the implications of this model are whatever you got last, that's your technical education. So uh, whatever your last few courses in college were, those are the courses you're going to try to apply when you get out into the labor market. So, so the, I mean, I, if, you know, if, I'm, if a surgeon is working with me, I want them to have several years of technical education in that sense. I, I, so I think it's a, I mean, this is kind of a, an abstract model in some sense or a simplification. And, you know, when you think about, I mean, at Teachers College, many of our students have undergraduate degrees that don't necessarily, that aren't, you know, closely aligned to the, to, the, to the degrees that they're getting here. And, you know, I, I think that that's a basically accumulating, a, you know, a richer amount of kind of general skills that they're getting. And that, th that those, you know, while they don't, while they're not, you know, specifically about the thing they end up doing, those provide kind of a background. Now, you know, some of these questions said, is that the most efficient way to do that? I mean, I guess part of that is I would say that, um, you know, there is a, I mean, education isn't only about preparing you for work. So there's other things. I mean, you asked about, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you educate the more citizenship or ethical things which are, which we want, whether you're working or not. So I don't, I think it's a, I think the point that we want to make is that, is that there, there's no, you know, we need both of them, and how do we put those together? 
I mean, you, you can think of models where they're, where they're happening simultaneously at some point as well. So I, I, don't, I think it's too simplistic to just say only general skills and then only technical skills. Those kind of need to go together as well. Um, hi. Um, so I kind of want to get to the to the kind of core idea of this uh, the whole false dichotomy. Um, as, so I was actually a transfer student in undergrad. I started at CUNY, then went to one of those like did, did the jump to like an elite liberal arts institution. And one of the things I saw was a lot of my friends from community colleges basically had just chunks of the work that they'd done over the years just kind of vanish because these schools don't take all these credits. It what. See, it seems to be an, a really arbitrary decision to just say, hey, education, nursing, courses, these don't count. Um, and so there's this um, sort of, my question sort of has to do with the liberal arts institutions and kind of four-year colleges themselves. Like what role do they play or do we play in breaking that kind of, that false narrative? Well, okay. <clears throat> so you're, you're now getting into a territory where you should definitely go to the CCRC website because we've done a lot of work there on the transfer issue. Um, and there's actually been a big controversy where you probably lived through it, you know, at, at CUNY. Clive was teaches at Queens College and was just having a discussion about the, that issue, you know, today. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right that this is a, um, you know, many of the credits that students earn at community colleges don't transfer. So, uh, so there, I think that, it, that we did a study in Texas and a typical community college student who transfers and graduates from a Texas four-year college has about 150 credits instead of 120. So you can imagine all the people, and that's because the, many of the credits didn't count, and so they have to take them again. And those are students who are you know, you know, working to pay for that, or the, it, even if they have scholarships or financial aid, they're having to support themselves, et cetera. So that's like a terrible social thing that happens. And I think it's, there's, there's just a design issue and, a, and a, 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 a problem of kind of bias against community colleges. And, and then there's a substantive question about what it is. So, you know, I, th I think that, you know, when you're thinking about, uh, you know, a, a four-year uh, experience or college or, you know, the, what you need to get a bachelor's degree, you know, that has to be designed and understood. Uh, and, and so it's a, one of the complications is if you, you know, if you're a community college and you transfer to many different places, it's difficult to design that. So I think that that's a policy issue that requires those institutions to be working together to understand I mean, they need to think better about what it is that students need, and then they have to make agreements about, you know, about what, you know, what will count, and, and then students need to know that uh, when they start. And of course, community colleges don't have um, much money to provide counseling. So, I mean, all of those things kind of come together. So it's a, certainly the issues that we're talking about here today are part of that, but I mean, in addition to that, it's just, you know, the, the system isn't put together in a way that 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 is that allows students to move through that effectively, and you know, and the, 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 especially those students who don't have a lot of family and knowledge and other kinds of things that help that help them you know solve those problems without the institution doing that. So, so I think if some of the implications of this model and the literature make me as a professor. I'm a bit of an outlier on this, but I should be a lot more humble when I start prescribing course requirements. I, I, as an economist, it would have been much better for me to have taken an undergraduate degree in physics or math. It would have been a lot easier, but apparently I can't be an economist unless I've taken macroeconomics. I never use macroeconomics. I can't even remember what most of it is, but I had to take it because I'm not an economist unless I do that. So there's a lot of prescriptiveness, and I think this gets to your question. If I, if I had to move, I would move towards a just get 120 credits in 40 courses 
and move along people. Whereas we have a kind of an elitist view that you, you can't be an economist unless you've done econometrics. That's what economists do. But th that, that seems very prescript. It seems a, almost like a kind of a uh, special interest way of thinking that we're going to force you to take econometrics because that's what economists do. And you can't be an economist unless you know econometrics. So I, I'm more in favor of, a, of an approach which would allow students more flexibility in crafting a, a general set of skills than the kind of the prescription that we force on them, which is you have to take these courses in this order. And if you don't do that, you're not an economist. Well, I, the only thing I'd, I mean, there's a substantive issue for that, but then there's also, you know, what gets counted. So you can think about the kind of optimal design of what of what those are. I think I perhaps would be more prescriptive, prescriptive than you would be, but but at the same time you don't want people to end up with those 120 credits and then have somebody come along and say no, you know, 50 of these don't count, so that you know you don't get your degree. So anyway, you should end okay. almost now. Or okay. Unless somebody has a yes or no question. Go okay. ahead. Um, so first of all, just a comment. Um, this crash course in technical skills right before graduation, maybe since you're not so happy with the C, it should be continuing technical education that happens intermittently throughout someone's work life. That's just a thought. I'm from a mill, a mill town, and I have a, like my father has a ninth grade education. He was a carpenter. Um, so there are so many questions I want to ask. But one thing is, um, I like the idea of moving away from credentialing, which addresses like this coursework. You have to have these certain things to have this credential. Um, but if we move towards a four-year education model for everybody, just because it's the right thing for the citizenry, how do you deal with the politics and the animosity between like more like conservative towns, typically conservative towns that uh, are focused on jobs versus like the more liberal uh, education model. So just well, question that doesn't that. sound like a yes or no question. But, but no, uh, look, uh, first of all, I don't think we're saying that everybody needs a four year degree. We're saying that that, you know, that and that's the question I asked. How do you how do you do this in a shorter amount of time? I mean, I, I, I think that the I mean, that's a deep issue that you, you know, that 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 you raise as far as the politics is concerned. I mean, you know, I, I think that I mean, that, I don't know that there's a way to, you know, get around that. I think, you know, we want to argue what it is that you need. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I, I think the short term, the typical kind of short term uh, certificate, CT type certificate, doesn't, you know, lead to a, you know, kind of long term, you know, improvement in, 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 in things. So I, I mean, I don't, I mean, I think they're just substantive arguments to be made which may or may not, even if they're accurate, may or not be convincing, so. It's a chicken and egg issue if what, maybe if you build liberal arts colleges in towns, then the town will magically become liberal. <laughs> I guess some good experiment with that. Um, anyway, thank you. Um, uh, for the record, uh, the American Academy has meetings and then it has something called stated meetings, which I've never quite been able to figure out what that means, but this was a stated meeting, which means it's very grand occasion uh, that's been going on since the 18th century. Um, so uh, the, the presentations uh, definitely rose to that level. So thank you very much. Thanks to everybody for coming.